Kia ora e te whanau ati karaiti. It's lovely to be with you again, even in this uh, strange kind of video way. As you probably know, uh, my family and I have been isolating this week so far after I received a positive COVID test on Monday. And I imagine some of you watching might be in the same boat. And we've so appreciated the many offers of and acts of support that we've received. We feel really loved. Uh, for me, the chief symptom that I've felt with COVID after the first couple of days has been fatigue. I've been very tired, um, maybe two thirds of each day I feel really, really tired. And I'm sorry, um, I, I feel that I might not give a, a very dynamic um, presentation today due to that fatigue um, affecting everything I do. It's been, I think, a pretty heavy week. I think you'll probably agree. Uh, the, the protest, the end of the protest, what became a, a real ugly stain on the country. The war in Ukraine, the credible prospect of, or credible possibility of, of world war even. The crazy flooding over in Queensland, so many people evacuated. Personally, I don't find it easy always to connect with my emotions, but I have found it uh, quite an emotional time. Perhaps you have as well. This sermon series, this sermon is part of a series that will go all the way through Lent up to Easter Day, broadly tackling this question, why be a Christian? in 2022. With all that's going on in the world, why be a Christian? My particular topic today, as I'm sure you already know, is, is the Christian story true? A comment from a friend of mine last week made me realise that this question begs another question. My friend, let's just call him Richard Diebel, told me about a pattern he has noticed in Christian groups over time. One thing that can happen in Christian churches and families is that we can get really excited about some particular important implication of the gospel. It could be any number of worthy things. Creation care, contemplative practice, economic inequality, family values, pacifism, whatever it is. The Eucharist, whatever. We can talk a whole lot about these things, really major on whichever particular implication of Christian, of Christian faith or aspect of Christian faith really excites us and maybe just assume the basics, the central core of Christian teaching. The risk is that the next generation comes up and they've heard a lot about our pet issues and not a lot about the core thing. And what's assumed by one generation isn't necessarily passed on to the next. So the question, my question begs is, what is the Christian story? What is basic Christianity? What's at the core of it? So I just wanted to spend a little bit of time giving you my five minute take on the core of what the story actually is before looping back to talk about whether it's true or not or how could we know that it was true or not. Last week Tim talked about some of the other stories that, that vie on our lives and he gave us the summary of the Christian story from the American theologian Walter Brueggemann. It's a beautiful summary, it's great, but I think it's missing something. I wonder if you could identify what it's missing, or if you would say it was missing anything. I'll come back to that, but just think for yourself, what's it missing? So what is the Christian story? There are lots of ways of telling it, and you might do a better job of it than me, but here is my quick version. Number one, there is a good God who is the creator of everything that exists. God is the source of all light and life and goodness, and God continues to sustain everything in existence moment by moment. Two, humans are one little part of this amazing creation, but we have a special role to play. We are made to care for the earth and develop its possibilities, to act with justice towards one another, and to acknowledge the gift, sorry, acknowledge the giver of our every breath. God is worthy of our praise. Three, and here's where that missing piece comes in. I don't know what you might have identified as missing, if anything, from Brueggemann's quote, but for me it was the ugly, ugly and unpopular word, sin. We humans are capable of extraordinary feats of bravery, kindness, solidarity, etc. But the Christian story tells us that despite these bright points, we are all mired in sin. The world is not the way we know it ought to be, and we are deeply implicated in that. Probably we can all admit that we are broken to some extent, that the troubles of life, difficult things that have happened, maybe things our parents did to us, have damaged us in different ways. We may also have a sense of the big systems that we are small parts of that make it hard to do the right thing, for instance in climate change. Those big systemic issues and our sense of brokenness are certainly manifestations of sin, 
but I want to stress that it goes deeper than that. It's mysterious and pretty unpleasant to deeply contemplate, but sin lives really deep inside of us. It infects our motivations, our goals, our self-understanding, our political opinions, our commitments, our intellects, our, how we raise children, all our relationships. It's in old people, it's in small children, it's in brown people, it's in pink people, rich people, poor people. Sometimes it's very obvious, as in the war in Ukraine, sometimes it's much more subtle. There's something in our nature, according to the Christian story, that is turned against God. There's something in us that is, like Tim said a couple of weeks ago, turned in on itself. Something that says no to God. Something that alienates us from God. I've laboured this point a bit because I think it's important and shocking and true and not talked about enough, really. Humans by nature, according to the Christian story, have a disease, and half the time we revel in it. And as another friend of mine says, sin offends God's manner. In our natural state, God is not pleased with us. Point four. That, of course, is only the start of the story. The good news is that God has not left us to our own devices. Christianity claims that the eternal Son of God came into real human history roughly 30 lifetimes ago, was born to the human race, born to a young Jewish woman in Palestine, and was named Jesus. You know what he did. He healed people. He cast out demons. He was amazingly charismatic, and people from all walks of life felt compelled to follow him. He taught how to live. He said, astoundingly, that he himself was the punchline to all the stories in the Jewish scriptures. He called God his Father, and he said that he was the only way back to the Father. He challenged the powerful, and he was put to death in a horrible state execution. But he knew what was coming. He had known what was coming, and he had taught his followers to understand that this grisly death was the way that God was going to deal with the sin problem and reverse the alienation from God at the heart of the human race. And to prove who Jesus was, sorry, and to prove Jesus was who he said he was, God brought him back to life, resurrected him. The resurrected Son of God shared God's own spirit with his followers and made them agents of reconciliation, as Paul says. And everyone is invited. We are all invited to get over ourselves, to turn our backs on sin in all its forms to turn our lives over to Jesus Christ and to receive God's Spirit. The final chapter, the fifth chapter of the Christian story, is yet to come. It's the promise that what God did for Jesus in the resurrection, God will do for the whole creation. Wiping away every tear, healing all the suffering and brokenness and pain and death, restoring the creation to its full glory and resurrecting us along with it. Paul talks about creation being set free from its bondage to decay. That, in those five points, is roughly the story as I understand it. I'd love to hear if you have a better way of telling it. I think we should get good at telling it. But the original question remains. Is it true? It does feel pretty weird some days. As far as we can tell, fewer and fewer of our New Zealand contemporaries find it believable. But... I believe it is true. Of course there is a selection bias operating, because I wouldn't be invited to speak unless I did believe it's true, but I think I have reasons. I want to give you, from my own point of view, a sense of why I think it's true. I want to really quickly touch on a whole lot of different hints and clues and pointers that, to my way of thinking, point at Christianity, before finally focusing on a serious line of evidence that I think is worth everyone's consideration. I want to emphasize that these are pointers that I personally find compelling. None is a slum, slam dunk proof of that it's all true. Some may seem reasonable to you, others might seem idiosyncratic. Most of these are put in the form of a question. If the Christian story isn't true, how do we explain these things? Number one, why is there something rather than nothing? The universe doesn't seem necessary. What was before the Big Bang? Number two, where does maths come from? It seems like you need mathematics with all its order and complexity before you can have physics 
and the uh, creation of stars and the evolution of life and all the rest of it. Where does that mathematics come from that is necessary for the rest to, to keep going? Number three, closely related. Why is the world so orderly and understandable? How can our little minds make accurate predictions about what will happen light years away? If they're just products of random atoms banging together, how does that work? In 1936, Einstein wrote, The world of our sense experience is comprehensible. The fact that it is comprehensible is a miracle. Number four. Why are humans so special? We're so close to chimpanzees in some ways. But chimpanzees don't write symphonies. They don't send satellites into orbit. They don't fight world wars. Number five. Where does our sense of right and wrong come from? Where does our sense that some things are entirely and always wrong? Perhaps racism, for example. Where does that come from? Are human rights just nice ideas that some people like and others don't? Why do we feel that justice is more than just a matter of opinion? Number six. Why is it that so much of the most uplifting architecture is religious? Why are so many of the greatest pieces of music composed to the glory of God? It seems like there's a pointer there to me. 7. This one is a bit self-serving perhaps, but I've noticed in that charity organisations in this country, charity organisations in this country, tend to be full of Christians, or have religious roots. Salvation Army, Presbyterian support. I volunteered with the Samaritans phone line when I was a bit younger, and while they offer a non-religious listening service, the place was just riddled with Christians, for example. Number eight, moving back into the world of the New Testament. I wonder, if not for the resurrection and the sending of the Spirit of God, how did those first disciples of Jesus come to be so bold and effective? In the Gospels, they seem often so feeble, so frightened and confused. But after the resurrection, they're not afraid of prison, beatings, or even death. And the moment, so the movement they lead, starting from an imperial backwater, so quickly spreads throughout the whole world, transforming it entirely. Number nine, almost a special case of the previous one, St. Paul. He had, as you know, dedicated himself to hunting down and imprisoning the followers of Jesus in those early years. If Jesus didn't appear to him on the Damascus Road, what was it that turned him into the Apostle to the Gentiles, the early church's greatest theologian and the most effective community organiser that it had? Now finally, there's the point the pointer I want to spend slightly more time on, eyewitness testimony. Here I'm mostly relying on Richard Borkham. Richard Borkham is a historian and theologian at Cambridge University, among other institutions. He's a lovely man. I met him briefly a few years back when he did some talks in Wellington. His work has really changed how many scholars see the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. For maybe a century, modern biblical scholarship had seen the Gospels as something like folklore. The view had been that after Jesus' death, scattered Christian communities passed around stories about what he had done said, retold, retold them and shaped them to fit what was important to them, what felt meaningful to them, and eventually they got collected up and written down. And the texts that we have are in this view the result of a gradual sort of evolutionary process over lots of years that probably tells us much more about the communities that produce them than it does about the real Jesus of history. But Borkham has seriously cha changed that picture. He has convincingly argued that the ancient world was in the main not interested in anonymous community productions. It was interested in testimony. For history to be seen as reliable in that context, it had to ideally be written by people involved in the actual events, or failing that, by someone who could interview eyewitnesses who had actually been there. Borkham says, In the case of the Gospels, we have exactly the kind of testimony that historians in the ancient world valued, the eyewitness testimony of involved participants who could speak of the meaning of events they had experienced from the inside. He notes, for example, the way that Matthew, Mark and Luke made a point of listing the names of the apostles in their accounts. Ancient readers wanted to know what was the authority behind these words? Who is standing behind the story guaranteeing its authenticity? To be accepted as reliable, 
people had to have confidence that these stories came from eyewitnesses who had really been there. When we had the series on Paul's letter of 1 Corinthians last year, I made a similar point. Paul was writing only about 25 years after Jesus' death. I can remember things 25 years ago. His cosmopolitan audience could have made, in principle, could have made the journey to Jerusalem and talk with the particular individuals he names who had been with Jesus and been taught by him and seen him resurrected. It wasn't murky ancient history to them. It could be verified. So what I'm saying, trying to say is that the Gospel writers told the story of Jesus' life in a way that would have been seen as good historical practice by the standards of the time. The story they tell, I believe, demands our attention and serious consideration. I hope you'll agree that there are good reasons to think that it might be a true story. The story is about God entering the world to rescue it from its bondage to decay. And the best thing is that each one of us is invited to make that story our own. To be forgiven, to be healed, to have the sin problem dealt with, as painful as that will be, and to be connected to the very Spirit of God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In a hurrah.